and uh, welcome back to another Common Lisp tutorial. Um, quickly before we get started, I just want to thank everyone that um, sent in suggestions or recommendations. I'm going to try and incorporate as many of these as possible in the video. However, I'm aware that the videos do tend to take quite some time. So if I don't implement your particular suggestion, uh, please don't think that means that I didn't want to. I'm just aware that um, time is not always on my side in these videos and I don't want to bore people too much by having a two hour long video. Um, if this works out and this video, you know, if people enjoy this video all and want to see more working on the same problem, we'll look at incorporating even more and maybe we'll even look at building a graphical interface around this, maybe using um, GTK or and curses, you know, who knows. Um, but once again, thank you for everyone that, that got in touch and um, had questions or suggestions. Really do appreciate it. And if you see anything in this video or you've got questions, please don't hesitate to, you know, drop a comment or um, hit me up on Twitter. I'm also working on a website for putting out errata on these videos. Um, I've got most of it in place now, I just don't have, I'm not a CSS expert, so um, I'm struggling to get the, the, the UI uh, for these videos looking pretty good. Um, I'll probably ping one of my buddies on how to um, make a website you know, look good. I'm great at tying database backends into it, but actually getting CSS to work, I haven't got a catch chance in hell. Um, so yeah we will soon have a website for these videos and any corrections or anything will get put into um, an errata section. So corrections and whatnot can be made available before the next video um, or if we never come back to the subject again, they're at least recorded for posterity's sake. Um, so that will be available soon. Uh, anyway, uh, we've got a, a few suggestions to get through and um, we're going to introduce the common lisp object system in this video. We're going to play with um, CLOS um, and we're not going to increase the size of this code by more than a couple of lines. So it's all going to be pretty good stuff. Um, I had a lot of fun coming up with it. Uh, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. Uh, I find when you're learning a new language, such as I'm doing here, uh, immersing yourself in the language and learning how to think the way the language is designed can be a challenge um, because one has to get out of the, the mindset of the language that you're used to thinking in uh, and, and think in the idioms. So even if you're thinking in abstract terms, like, well, we just put a loop here, it doesn't really matter what loop in what language, um, you still have to express those abstract terms, um, those abstract ideas in terms of the target language. So even though I knew what I was trying to write here, uh, learning how to express that uh, and um, learning how to write it idiomatically, specifically, was a bit of a challenge this week. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And um, hopefully you will have a uh, fair bit of fun while we improve this. So the first thing we are going to do is have a look at this function. Um, that's it, we're done with this function. Um, the reason we're putting that here and what it does is it flushes the buffer, um, the standard output buffer. So if there's anything that has been told to be written to the screen that has not quite got there yet, this will force it. Um, this is because although Common Lisp is a very stable standard and probably isn't likely to be changed anytime soon, if at all, um, they left certain things up to implementers to decide how they wanted to do stuff. This is just one of those corner cases where um, some versions of uh, Common Lisp may not necessarily flush everything to the buffer when you think it might, and that force output function is just there to make sure everything that should be on the screen is on the screen. Um, we're also going to reach down and get our game over p function. We're going to move it up a wee bit. To under here. There we go. We're going to get rid of 
these three lines as well because we don't need them. And we're going to get rid of that blank line. Yeah, there we go. We don't need to, to update board the update board function or update the valid position p function. They're perfectly fine as they are. Uh, a suggestion is we could have passed in uh, chords as key parameters, which is entirely true. We could. Um, let's have a think about that. Do we want to do that? Where am I calling um, update board? Um, the complexity has to go somewhere. Um, because we're we're building up property lists, uh, we could unpack it here. It has to be unpacked somewhere. Um, I do not know of a compelling reason to not do it here. There might be. I just might not know it. Um, but they they get packed up as a property list um, when in the various terms function, and they they've got to be unpacked somewhere. Uh, I would rather just pass them around as property lists until the point where they must be unpacked. That's my personal preference and that's my justification for doing it this way. Um, again, if there is a, a valid reason why that is wrong, please let me know. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is we are going to uh, change equal to EQL. Uh, because there are many equality predicate functions in Common Lisp. Uh, the first one, EQ, is object identity. It should probably have been called an ID function rather than an EQ function, uh, in my opinion, um, but I have not standardized a language before, um, and I do hold those that help standardize it in high regard. In fact, I worked for Global Graphics for some time, which I believe is where Kent Pickman uh, worked for a time as well, and he's done some wonderful work on the standardization effort, so uh, I am not going to assume that what I think it should be is necessarily the right way to do it. Um, but EQ is an identity function, EQL is simple equality, you've got equal um, and a couple of others, but the lowest common denominator is we can use the EQL function here rather than the equal, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, it's not done it everywhere, so we need to do that again. Um, it's found it here, um, but not here. it so let's try this again okay no idea why the editor didn't pick up those remaining eight but it's got it now so that's them all changed um, the only other changes really are to the game over p function this draw p function is a closure it does not need a parameter representing the board pass to it because it can get it from the uh, all lexical scope. Uh, we're going to make another little change to it. We're going to copy those and put those there. We're going to get rid of this counter stuff. That's going to return T in a bit. we're just changing the, the draw p function. It's going to loop over the grid like it always did. 
uh, but instead of counting how many um, dashes it found, it's going to return early from the draw p function, and because we don't give it a value to return, it will return nil. Otherwise, if it didn't return here at the end of the nested loop, it will return true. So uh, return nil if there is a dash, which means it's not a draw. Otherwise, end the loop and return true, which means it is a draw. So that is um, the big change that we're making to the the draw p function, and it's not even a big change. We're just um, we're optimizing it. We're not going through all nine um, uh, positions in the board. It you know if it finds one at zero zero, it goes well. Found one, stops, and it breaks out early. So it's more efficient. Um, however, for the rest of it, we are going to um, I'm going to decompile these. I don't know if they if they already exist. Um, I think my editor has ju just started. Okay, we're going to uh, get rid of those. Decompile them. We're going to get rid of those because we're going to introduce the commonless object system. Uh, I'm also going to delete but not decompile game because we're still going to have a game function. It's just going to be substantially different. Um, so, um, I'm going to give you uh, a brief detour history lesson type thing. Um, when I was uh, in South America last year, um, I ended up in a coffee shop in the Andes Mountains and I was just reading a lisp book that I'd brought with me. And it was starting to talk about the, the um, common lisp object system and I had a bit of a, a revelation. And I don't know if anybody else has, has bothered to explain this. It was certainly never taught to me when I went to university, but. I've discovered there are three philosophical branches of object orientation in computing. You have what, for better or worse, is being called classical programming, uh, classical object orientation, um, which is not really classical. It's, um, it's kind of, if you use C++ or Java or Python, it's that kind of object system. You create a class and you can make an instance of a class, and classes have properties and methods contained within them. Um, C++ and Java are far more similar than Python, but they still have the same basic uh, properties of attributes and methods. Uh, JavaScript and languages like it, such as Self, Prototype, IO, and Lua, are um, prototype-based languages. Um, single inheritance model where you look up a chain for an attribute or method and you shadow existing ones by directly adding methods or attributes to an object and you you might use the new keyword as in JavaScript or you might use like meta tables as in Lua um, I don't know enough about self prototype or IO to to necessarily know how they would do it, but they, they are prototype-based languages. That's the second philosophy. The third, uh, I believe, is the original ideology of object orientation. Um, and this is, uh, Alan Kay didn't invent the concept, but he did explore it a lot and certainly popularized it and um, made it mainstream. Um, I don't know if he was aware there was other engineers working on the problem and he came up with his solution independent and was just later, or if he was aware of another team working on it, but he was at Xerox Park and he was a, a Lisp coder, um, came up with a language called Smalltalk, which is more of a message passing system. Uh, you have objects and they can communicate with one another. Uh, and this is where Common Lisp fits in. It is more like the small talk message passing system than either of the two other philosophies. Um, so when you see the code we're about to see, you might wonder how it works or what it's even doing or that it just looks plain strange. But that's because it comes from a different design philosophy. And um, it works. It's a good, uh, it's a good system. It's different, but it's a good system. 
So with all that being said, uh, I'm just going to type uh, an example and we'll show you how we build one up. So um, just like we do defun, we would do def class. And this is how we um, build one. We, we take a name and you can have inheritance, multiple inheritance here by passing in a list of things to inherit from. This is going to be a base class. So it's not going to have anything it inherits from. So it takes an empty parentheses list. And a class only has properties, which might sound very strange. So um, we're going to create an icon property. And we're going to say that in order to set this on the class, you do init uh, arg, and you say colon icon. And this is the, the name we will pass when we initialize the class uh, and how we give it a value. Uh, you can give it a default value with init form but I don't want to. So I'm going to say that if someone um, tries to initialize a class without setting an icon, it's going to fail. Observe. Let me compile that. Now, um, there's no new keyword in Common Lisp. Uh, you don't create a new instance. Um, using new, you do make instance, and you pass in the symbol that represents the class, in this case, player. Um, and remember, there are different namespaces. There's two namespaces in Common Lisp. So we can have a symbol that points to a, a value, and we can have a symbol that points to a class or function, and it knows what we mean. So we're creating a player that is an instance of a player. A bit confusing, but that's just some of the magic. So let's execute this. And we have a deliberate stack trace here. You'll see that it says must provide an icon, which is exactly what I've put there. So I have tried to create a class um, and it's not worked because you must pass it an icon property. So let's get rid of this uh, stack trace and let's run this now. Um, set that to nil. So we can see here um, format nil the player object. We can see we've got player with uh, that. Now you might wonder how we get the icon. So um, these are what's called slots and there is a very a powerful slot system um, that you can use to get at attributes in a class. Um, but I'm not going to cover that today. There's only so much I can cover in these videos. Um, what you can do is this. I'm going to recompile that. And you can see here that we've got an X down here. Uh, if I change that to an O, uh, and I run that, you'll see that we get O here. So by adding this keyword reader with icon, it creates a, a method behind the scenes um, that takes a player object that we can um, use the function to say, I want the icon property of player, but we call it like a function. Um, there's also a, a writer um, keyword. We're not going to use it here. In fact, we're not going to really use the reader here. Um, and there's also an accessor which combines reader and writer. So it depends what sort of access level you want your class to have, whether it's a read only, a write only, or a read write property. Uh, and if you were to have a writer or an accessor, you'd use setf um, icon player with the value, just like we used setf um, last week. So that's how we create um, a, a class. Uh, so let's get rid of this because we, we, we don't need it for what we're doing here. So you might be legitimately wondering, like, how do we do anything with these classes then if they only ever contain properties? Uh, and they have this um, system called generic methods. And generic methods are not part of the object system. They are part of uh, the common list standard itself. You can create a generic method. Um, and it's, it's linked into the type system. Uh, so you can um, 
have methods with the same function signature, um, but you specialize on a, uh, a type. And so if I had two functions, um, let me just test something. So that's a bit. float. So we've defined a generic function called TMP. Um, it's no class named. Um, I might have this the wrong way around. with a different data type then. Um, okay, that worked. Um, all right, whatever. Um, so we take a variable and a type and a variable and a type. Uh, so we've compiled all this up. So we're going to call the temp function um, with a list. Now let me bring up the interpreter just so we can see what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to execute this. So we got this one. This function ran. Now, if I pass in this, we get that one with 1.1, which is this function method. Um, so we created a generic method that takes something called num. Um, doesn't really matter what it's called. And it says that the, the abstract point of the temp function is to print something, which it does. Um, but it just, it's called method dispatching. So it dispatches one of these methods, although they have the same name, they take, um, they specialize on different data. So if this took a list, this function would work, a non-empty list, I should stress, this function is executed. If it took a floating point integer, a number, this function would run. So you can see here, we're not doing anything with player, we're just doing stuff with um, generic functions. So this proves to you that the generic and the def methods are independent of of the object system. They're more closely tied into the type system. So um, I'm going to decompile this because we don't need it anymore. That was just to prove a point. Now we have to unbind them all because they are, although they have the same name, they are um, all compiled up with different things. So what we can do is because we know um, these functions are based on the type system. Classes are a way of creating new types. Um, oh, right, okay. Uh, my microphone is uh, at the bottom of the screen, so I, I can't always see um, this area. Uh, 
so we've got the, the, the player class. Now, let's subclass something. So this is a, a human that subclasses on a player. Now, it doesn't do anything else. It doesn't add any more properties. So that's it. Uh, we're going to do the same for the computer. Subclasses from player, doesn't add anything to it. But what we have here is we have um, specialist subclasses of a player class. And because they're, I suppose, analogous to types uh, and they can behave and work just like types, we can then use the um, generic, the def generic def methods of the type system to plug into the object system here. Um, and that being the case, we can have a generic method called turn, which will take a player and a board So we've got that. This is going to be our generic method. It takes a player and a board. It's just totally abstract. All it does is it, it sets it up for us to be able to um, target a method that will run when it's um, passed a message with certain types. And that sounds really sort of abstract and computer science-y. So I apologize, but we'll step through this. We'll build the next bit. We define an implementation method, which has the same name, in this case, turn. And it's going to take a, uh, a player, which is going to be the, um, abstract type, but it's going to be specific to a CPU. Um, and it takes a board. Now you've not seen this before, um, so this is a way of saying um, it takes a player object, but only a CPU subclass of a player, and board is board, that's the parameter we pass to it. Um, if we were to do the same for something else, once again it, it executes on a player, but this time it takes a human um, and if we were to um, going to um, create a little lap block we're gonna say CPU is make instance uh, human icon X and this is gonna be um, human CPU make instance CPU icon O And we're just going to say turn um, human uh, turn takes at least two arguments. Sorry, I need to pass something else into that. I'm just going to pass in a number. Um, turn when called with arguments. What? Um, Probably not recompiled it. Yeah, there we go. I just hadn't recompiled it. So we can see in the bottom um, that we've created a human object um, and we call turn on the human. Uh, so we can see that down here. We 
we can change this to CPU. And we can see that it printed our CPU. Uh, and it's uh, printing out style warnings because we're not we're not using all of these. We're just we're just setting that up for testing, so don't worry about that. But you can see that the, the functions were dispatched based on the subclasses. So that's pretty cool. But let's actually, you know, do something with it. Uh, this is where um, we, we are replacing our CPU and player terms. And they do largely the same thing. Um, the code looks very, very similar, but there's subtle differences. Um, so for the player, we do a do star. setting up the variables that will be involved in this uh, do loop. And the way that you do that is you set a initial state of the um, variable, then you set a state um, that it will change by or to uh, each loop iteration. And that's why we're duplicating a lot of stuff here. Uh, yeah, that's what we want the CPU to do. find it. Um, there's no warning so valid position P must uh, be in the namespace. Yeah it's there now. It's fine. Um, so let's get rid of that. Let's copy all of this but we need to uh, make something specific for our player. We're going to use flat again and we're going to define a function that's just going to um, It's pretty trivial, but it's it's three lines, and it's gonna it's gonna be used four times here. So we want to abstract that. I, and, um, you know, not have it um, globally available. So this is going to be uh, get pause, which takes character, um, and then what it does is it formats t. Uh, please enter. that then we force the output then we parse integer read line uh, and we take jump allowed to be t so we move this do inside of that So you get pause x, get pause x, and it's the same here. We're gonna uh, get pause y. chords stay the same um, and what we want to do for the human player is uh, because this is going to generate numbers within the correct range we need to do something for the human turn here we need to say um, and member 
x uh, 0 1 and 2 member x y 0 1 and 2 valid position e board core So that is our, our human turn. Um, we just declare that, that get pause function locally in the, the flip, uh, and we call it up to four times, I guess. Um, now, just to reiterate, because I, I feel I skipped over it a little bit too quickly as I was writing it, and this gave me a fair bit of trouble when I was learning it. The do, um, and the do star behave like let and let star. So we can, within these parentheses, um, here, um, within th this piece of highlighted text here, we have um, a symbol, x, y, and chord, or three symbols, x, y, and chords. And uh, we have a value here, which is random array dimensions, baud zero, for both x and y. And then we have it again. And this is what it will be set to when the loop is initialized. And it's the same here with chords. Um, we use do star so we can use x and y from earlier in the the symbol chords, the, the value stored in chords. And um, when the loop loops, this is what will be used to set the new value. So initial value on the left, or rather symbol on the far left, initial value in the center and uh, updated value every time the loop runs on the right. Um, so once you've finished with the do star block where you're setting up your um, symbols and variables, you have the um, what to do uh, when um, when the loop comes to an end. The, the first thing is the um, expression that will terminate the loop. And the next thing is what the value that will be returned. And if you want to do anything in the loop body, you would put it in here if you wanted to. We are not because everything can actually be controlled um, through the, the generation of data in the loop. We don't need to print anything because this is the CPU just randomly generating stuff. We don't, we don't want to see anything. We don't need to do anything. Just the, the virtue of having the do mechanics here allows us to do everything we need to do um, without needing to have a body in the do. And it's very, very similar here with the, the uh, player. We just use the F let so we can have this utility function in place um, because it would be far easier just having one function that has the three lines and is called four times than having these three lines four times. Um, but the, the principle is the same. We, we have our X, our Y and our cohorts which are bound to an initial value and then are rebound every time the loop loops. Uh, our termination is, is slightly different. Uh, we have this and expression where we need to make sure that x is a member of the list 0, 1, or 2. Uh, y is a member of the list 0, 1, and 2. And uh, generally, um, the chords themselves are a valid position on the board. And uh, if that is true, we exit uh, giving chords. Otherwise, we loop. Uh, and we're, we're done with our utility functions. The only thing that's left for us to do now is to re-implement the game function. Um, and we're going to do that a little bit differently. Um, we are going to make better use of the do loop. Um, we had a let, a do inside of a let, which wasn't necessary. We can use do um, like a let, as we're doing here. So we're going to defun game. Uh, it takes no parameters this time. We're just simply going to set everything up um, either in a let or in a do. So the first thing we're going to do is um, make random state t because it is not necessary to reset the uh, random number generator every time. We can reset it once when the game function runs and that's it. Uh, when that function runs, the random number generator will be reseeded 
and that's, that's all we need, it's good enough for us. Uh, next thing, we're going to set up a light block with our, our board, our human, our CPU. So board is as it ever was, make array, uh, three by three, uh, and its initial element is a dash. set up our human which is make instance human icon x then we're going to set up our cpu which likewise is make instance with cpu which takes an o i'm just going to line this up a little bit can see things just a little bit easier. Um, then we're going to have our do loop. Now I've set these things up inside of a let because these are never going to change um, during a loop so it doesn't make sense to declare them inside of a loop but things like our loop counter absolutely should be in a do and that's what's going to happen in the do turn counter um, it's going to be equal 1 plus random 2. That's going to be its initial value. And on subsequent loops, we're just going to increment the turn counter. Uh, we're going to check that game over p board um, is our exit condition. We're not going to return anything right now. So this is where we differ here, where we would return coords and not have a loop body. We're going to have a loop body now. So we're going to say display board. Then we're going to print out that, that line that we do. We're going to force output, just to be clear. Um, I'm going to new line it so it's a little bit easier to read. Um, I'm also going to put a new line there, so again, it's a little bit easier to read. Uh, and we're going to do our if even p turn counter update board board turn human board x or update board board turn CPU board O. Oh. Then finally, we're going to say display board board. T game over. Finally, we're just going to force output again, and we're going to compile this. So we've now got our, our game function rebuilt. Um, so we have our we, we declare our three variables, uh, we declare our turn counter, uh, and what is going to end the game. Uh, we don't use a do star here because we've only got one thing. Um, and even if we had multiple things, we've got nothing that depends on anything else. So just a straight up do is fine. Uh, I'm going to put a comment here. So you can see that everything here is the loop body. So, you know, we loop until game over is true, incrementing the turn counter each time we loop. So we display the board, display a new line, enforce it, then we just run the update board having run the appropriate turn function passing in the appropriate uh, not or cross then because this is the uh, end of the do loop body at the end we can display the board uh, format game over and force output in theory we, we could have turned all of that into a string and then printed it out as the return value I'm not going to do that. Um, I think 
if we were going to do that, it'd probably be better returning who won, and we've not determined that in this iteration of the code yet. But never mind. Um, so I'm going to make this a wee bit bigger, and we're going to give the game a go. Uh, index nil for simple. Right, okay, so we've got a, an issue somewhere. I'm going to restart the interpreter so it's, it's completely clean because we did some experimental stuff we played about with the object system um, I'm gonna restart the REPL and just load these functions in one by one Finding it, yeah, that's fine. I just couldn't remember. I forgot that. So we've recompiled the game. So let's try and run it. Okay, so I'm going to try and take the top left square. Um, I'm going to take the center square. I'm going to take the bottom left. Oh, it's frozen. This happens sometimes, unfortunately. Um, uh, let's restart that again. function to the bottom because it's a pretty big one. Let's go for the center square. Sometimes the interpreter gets a little bit stuck um, and crashes. Um, I'm not sure why, but I've seen it with, with other code that I've been writing. Um, I was getting it a lot here because I was creating uh, an indirect uh, infinite loop or uh, an unintentional infinite loop because I, I hadn't realized that you needed to have an initial value and then uh, a new value. Uh, but that's all corrected here and you can see that the game runs as ever it did so there you are i'm not going to take up any more of your time um i had a lot of fun making this and working on it um please if you've got any other corrections or questions or you want to see something in particular let me know i'll be more than happy to to try and accommodate that uh, there's more stuff I'm going to try and do. I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to be doing next week um, because next week is my last week out of work. Next, uh, The following week I will be teaching programming full time. Um, so I may not have quite the same release schedule as I did. Hopefully I will. Um, but after next week I've not, I've not really got planned what I want to do next week with regards to videos. Um, I'll try and see if there's a, a f another text-based game or I might see if we can maybe do this in NCurses or GTK. We'll, we'll see how it goes. If you've got suggestions, let me know. But please look after yourselves, take care, um, and I will see you in the next one.